Welcome to Modern Management of the Older Adult, brought to you by the Institute of Clinical Excellence. Hey, everybody, it's Shelby Blankenship here from uh, MMOA. I'm one of your fabulous TAs, and this is my husband, Corey. He is one of my um, the co-owner of Stave Off with me, and he's also a strength and conditioning coach. He also has a CF level one, and then he's also a Metro firefighter. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about is diabetes and using a CGM monitor to kind of help um, filtering when it comes to exercise, how people's blood sugars are, and why we even care about what people's blood sugars are. And the biggest reason why my husband is here is he has type 1 diabetes, and he um, has had a lots of experience when it comes to the different ways you can um, monitor your blood sugar and what the current um, technologies are. So, Corey, um, can you tell me a little bit about when you were diagnosed and like what they did to monitor your blood sugar? Yeah, absolutely. So I was diagnosed when I was five years old. Uh, I'm 37 now, so 32 years of diabetes. Uh, when I was first diagnosed, you were able to check your blood sugar by pricking your finger. You'd put your blood on a test strip, and within about three to five minutes, it would turn that test strip a color, and then you held it up to a scale, and you matched up on there to a number that corresponded with that color. So not super efficient, uh, very slow, and not really precise. Uh, within a couple of years, they had it to where it was a about three minutes to download a number, and it would give you a more precise number, but still three minutes. That took a while. Um, it progressed over the years, got quicker, took less blood, and now most CGMs are, or I'm sorry, most glucose monitors are at the point now where it takes about five seconds to get you a result. Awesome. So, I mean, since we've been married, I've seen, you know, the different variations mm -hmm. of the glucose monitors that you've used. And there's obviously tons of different variations and companies that make them. But a lot of people are transitioning now to the continuous glucose monitor. Yes. Um, what would you say uh, was the reason for you switching? Um, I was just trying to get better control over my diabetes. Um, I, I, you know, I've always controlled it really well yeah. with diet and exercise, but there were still times that I struggled with uh, my A1Cs being higher than I wanted to. And those have become less of a standard just because, yeah. you know, basically that's just giving you an average and a few high numbers and low numbers can throw it off. But it's still kind of the standard that a lot of people use to judge maintenance of diabetes. Okay. Um, so trying to get better control over that, I switched over to the CGM and that gives you real time results. So you're not having to prick your finger and test with blood. Mm -hmm. um, it's as simple as putting the sensor on your arm or your leg or wherever you want to use it. Mm -hmm. It interfaces with your phone via Bluetooth. And at any point you can look and see what it is. So you can see how your blood glucose responds after a meal, uh, after exercise, during exercise, really whatever you want. Okay. So when you were using like your glucose monitor where you actually pricked your finger, mm -hmm. how many times were you doing that per day? It was anywhere from eight to 10 times a day. Okay. Um, and then there were times where it was a lot more than that. If I was doing really intense exercise, like when I started CrossFit, when I was doing Tough Mudders and things like that, mm -hmm. you'd have to check really often because those could affect it significantly. So, um, you know, on a, a low day, eight times, but it could be up to 15 times a day. When you were having to get that prescription refilled, how much were they usually allotting for you to prick your finger per day? To get any more than about four times a day was a struggle with the insurance company. So okay. that required my doctor having to write a letter, getting pre-authorization for more strips. And even then they would fight you on it. And it was just, it was a hassle. Okay. Because I know, especially with type one monitoring before and after meals is probably like the biggest one people think about right. not always um, exercise. Cause usually, especially what 15, 20 years ago, a lot of people didn't exercise when they had um, type one diabetes because they were really nervous yeah. about the highs and the lows and how it would affect them. Yeah. So I think the CGM, it sounds like since you don't have to worry about those um, pricking your finger and the number of strips that you have, is automatically better 
purely on you're not having to one hassle with insurance when it comes to like the number of finger sticks that you mm -hmm. need, but also just like the um, how readily available the readings are versus, right. you know, having to wait so long to decide like, can I eat this? Can I not eat this? Or yeah. what snacks do I need to bring? Because I know you've kind of talked about in the past, like one of the worst parts about having diabetes is it loses, um, you lose spontaneity right. with your capacity to do things because you always have to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have extra blood sugar um, monitors just in case one fails. You yep. have to have extra food in case you need it. You have to have a, you know, extra insulin or extra, you know, all these kind of extra things. Extra supplies, extra batteries in case your batteries go dead. It right. Was, it was everything. And I'm and not saying that CGMs don't fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are technology. They do fail sometimes. But how often do you run into that issue? Very little. And I've been using a CGM regularly for about four years now. I've had less than probably five fail. Okay. Um, and it's a very easy fix when they do. It's as easy as just placing another sensor on and then going through the, the warm up period for that. And the companies are typically very quick to replace a sensor that's failed free of charge too. Okay. So, you know, there's obviously differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And type 1 tends to, I would think, in most people's mind, be a little bit more severe mm -hmm. um, as far as, like, in um, amount of things that need to be monitored and how frequent they need to be monitored. And most of the time in older adults, we're probably seeing more of the type 2 diabetes or the pre-diabetes. Right. Not saying we definitely can see type 1, but for those who have type 2 diabetes, what, from a firefighter standpoint, because mm -hmm. you see a lot of medical calls, what do you see tends to be like the issue when you go on calls? So like they are, what are their blood sugars and how often are they monitoring them? It tends to fall into the extremes. Most of these people are not monitoring their blood sugar mm. well at all. I mean, we had someone recently who uh, ended up having to have a foot amputated and he had not checked his blood sugar in over a week, he said. And it was, I think it was 875 when we checked Oof. it, which is so far above what it should be. Um, but we also run into people who, because they're not checking it, it's going low mm -hmm. and they're not aware that it's dropping and find themselves in a situation where they become almost unresponsive and are not able to take care of themselves because of it. And I would say probably, and one of the biggest things at MMOA we really kind of strive for is trying to give people the most independence as possible and them being aware of things they need to monitor and trying to limit like the extra stuff. Mm -hmm. So having something like a CGM is really nice because it's a quick, like literally like you swipe it with your, um, on your arm or your leg or wherever it is. And it's an, quick reading, not only for them, but also for y'all. Right. Like you don't have to go get the finger stick kit. You don't have to do all these extra steps, which is really nice, but it also monitors them throughout whatever they're eating. Because I know you and I have done this mm -hmm. where I, I don't have any um, issues with diabetes. However, I wanted to see what my blood sugar was doing with certain meals and ours do not do the same things on the same meal. No. So like, you know, if he had rice, um, it might spike it, you know, 50, 60 points. But for me, it might be like a big spike. And then my um, insulin will automatically kick in a little bit faster just because I have insulin already in my body. Um, but I'll get more spiking rather than just like this gradual kind of, um, I'm going to call it like the little kid roller coaster. Like we want the little kid roller coaster. We don't want like the big kid where it's like up and down, up and down, up and down. Because that's where, you know, you get, start getting other issues pop up, whether it's other comorbidities. Um, one thing that I notice, especially with older adults, is blood sugar is so imperative to healing, whether that's internal things or wounds. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times people talk about, like, they have, like, diabetes and then they don't regulate their blood sugars. And once it gets over 200, like, they, the wound healing basically stops in your body. Because it's just trying to keep you alive at that point. So we want that kind of 90, 120 realm is where we kind of want to shoot for. And so if people really struggle with knowing where they're at, again, like Jeff Moore always talks about, like data helps drive results. So if you can monitor that and help them 
kind of regulate that. One, you're going to help with wound healing, but also with exercise. So let's talk a little bit about exercise for you um, with doing like high intensity training. What are some things that you need to monitor and kind of be aware of? It's it's really big to know where you're starting blood glucose wise before you go into one of those training sessions. Um, the type of session it could be could cause it to react in one of two ways. It can cause it to plummet. Um, but you also see a lot of times in like high intensity type workouts, a spike that happens initially afterwards because your body's releasing adrenaline. That adrenaline causes stored sugar, that muscle glycogen to be released into the bloodstream and your blood sugar skyrockets. So you might do a workout like that, look at your CGM afterwards and it's 300 and you're mm. like, oh my gosh, I got to correct this. But you have to know that that's, that's a temporary thing. It's going to, you know, work its way out of your system. So knowing what that starting point is and then just being able to see, like I said, how it's going to react to different workouts. Um, it's really going to help you a lot in the long run. And honestly, like I would say, even like from a personal standpoint, I think it's a great um, data driver. So like seeing the spikes in yourself, you'll know that people who have type one or type two diabetes, they're probably going to have more exacerbations of what you have when you don't have those um, issues. So I would highly recommend if you have access or are able to get a CGM, most people do. If there are companies that you don't have to have a, a script for, where you can just do it for 30 days just to kind of monitor yourself. And it's really helpful just to kind of know, like if you've had family history of diabetes, like that's something you can start watching for, especially in your like late 20s, 30s, et cetera, and just kind of see which foods tend to cause you more issues or the timing of it. Um, there's plenty of uh, resources out in social media. You kind of have to vet them a little bit, but just kind of knowing like, the timing of when you um, eat and when that is in relation to exercise, um, in relation to like what types of food you eat, like sometimes the order of them can kind of change up your blood sugar. Um, so just kind of being mindful of that. But the biggest thing that we kind of want to bring forth to you is that a CGM can be super, super helpful for our older adults. And Medicare actually does cover it. Starting in April of 2023, Medicare covers a CGM for people of any type of insulin um, need or they experience like severe hypoglycemia. Um, you also have to have a follow-up with your PCP or endocrinologist, uh, somebody every six months that is providing like Medicare covered services um, for your doctor's visit. So they can basically validate that you're still needing that um, CGM. There's tons of them out there. If they can't get it covered, you can do, um, there's like one-offs all over the place that you can just buy out, right? I think they can range from like 80 to like 150 bucks, <coughs> excuse me, which really isn't that bad as long as you're kind of getting that data. But also like if you can get it covered, like that's awesome. And two of the big ones are Dexcom and Freestyle Libre. Corey currently uses the Dexcom and he also has a tubeless um, insulin pump that it uh, talks with, which is super helpful for him to kind of keep his blood sugar in a really nice spot. Um, I've used personally the Freestyle Libre. Um, it's worked really nice. I just use it on the back of my arm um, and been really happy with it. So those are some options for you. Um, so just to kind of recap everything, um, CGM is the new way of monitoring your blood glucose levels. Um, especially for those with diabetes. Previously, it was, you know, using the pinprick and kind of, or the finger stick kit to kind of figure out where you were. And that has gradually and thankfully become a lot easier, a lot more efficient and ultimately saving a bunch more money because you're not having to like beg insurance for more of the strips. Um, number two, monitoring your blood sugar more consistently throughout the day how your meals are affecting you, how your exercise is affecting you. And then you can also look at things like recovery, just like how if you're having a big, really bad night of sleep or if you're on a certain medication like steroids and how much those can mess up your blood sugar if you're not careful. And then the third thing that we want to kind of really think about is how we could use this when it comes to exercise and monitoring our patients while they're in our care. So regardless if that's at home health, outpatient, 
um, inpatient rehab, et cetera, that data can be super, super helpful to know one, if they're hitting like that high intensity training, but also making sure they're not getting these really high highs or really low lows, or if they are getting them, what can we do to monitor that and make sure it's not just like this big spike where they're having a lot of issues, but is that spike directly related to exercise or something else? So that's kind of what we wanted to just kind of bring your attention to, especially now that Medicare is covering it. So now you have um, some education that you can provide your patients. Um, as far as courses go for MMOA, we have a live course coming up at in Kearney, Missouri in January 27th and 28th. We have another one February 17th in Oklahoma City. And then L1 will be starting again March 13th. And then L2 will not be until May 16th. So make sure you get your spots so that we can see you and have so much fun. Um, if you have any questions about this topic, please um, let me know. And I will definitely ask the expert if I don't know. Um, thank you again, Corey. And we hope you all have a great rest of your day. See ya. Thank you for listening to the MMOA podcast. If you found this helpful, please share with someone that could benefit. And if you're looking for more practical content to help you better serve older adults, head over to www.mmoa.online, where you can learn more about our free resources, our community, continuing education courses, and our certification. Once again, that's www.mmoa.online. Thanks for listening.